<clears throat> Thanks very much, uh, John, uh, for those kind words. Thank you, Shira, for asking me to give a small talk at this TED uh, conference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we have a problem. In fact, we have a big problem. The Lancet Commission produced its report earlier this year suggesting that five billion people across the globe do not have access to safe and affordable surgery. The population of the world is only seven billion. It's two thirds of the population who don't have access to surgery. We're not talking about robotic surgery. We're not talking about advanced laparoscopic surgery. What are we talking about? It's simple procedures. For example, the treatment of appendicitis by a simple operation. It's a, a cesarean section for women's health. Also, management of fractures and limbs, management of trauma that may recover patients quickly, giving them less morbidity. It's simple operations. In fact, it's estimated we need about 143 million operations per year across the globe to equalize health care. Governments, the UN, and other philanthropists have spent a lot of money and energy in talking about communicable disease. TB, HIV, malaria. And it's great to eradicate these worldwide problems. But actually, surgery will save many more lives, the entire combination of all communicable disease. We now have that quantification for us to de develop some solutions for it. Arts Hospital has been around for about a thousand years. For those that you know about history, we're here, Monk, in 1123, founded Bart's Hospital. We've had great surgeons, great innovators, who have been steadfast in their opinions on how to develop healthcare and also technology. At the same time that Bart's was being founded and Rahir was placing the first brick out in West Smithfield, there was a chap called Abu al Qasim al Zalawi, who was based in Andalusia around 1000 AD. He wrote the first textbook of surgery and innovation. Since that book was developed, it was then converted to Latin, called the Liber Therorici, and then spent, that book became the embodiment of surgery for 500 years. Across the Renaissance, across the whole of the first part of this last uh, uh, thousand years. So this was a text, a written text, knowledge-based. And we spent a lot of time reading, learning about medicine, and teaching others around language, around text, and how we get the best out of people. That was a thousand years ago. Things have changed immeasurably in that time. We have moved on. <laughs> and we've moved on to a world that we know well and love now, of course. What's different? There's the internet. There's connectivity. Connectivity is the single most important word for us all of today. We can't survive without, without smartphones. We can't survive without iPads, the iMac, or whatever other technology we have used to. There are smart watches, like so, for example, <laughs> that will now monitor. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. That will monitor us going forward, looking at cancer care, looking at follow up. We can wear wearable technology to monitor us throughout the entire 25 hour period. These will become part of our life. You've heard of the Internet of Things, that everything in this world will be connected at some point. This is not science fiction, this is close to reality. We're almost there already, and so we rely on this technology. That's moved us on, you see, about how we manage this whole uh, world that we live in. Connectivity is quite important, of course. If you think about the world as a whole, even remote parts of the world now have fairly good connections to the internet. If they don't, companies like Google are putting out balloons into the cloud. So places, remote places, can now access Wi-Fi and high-speed internet. Only a few weeks ago, you've also the refugee crisis in Syria, of course. Facebook have mentioned they will now make sure that every refugee in the world has access to the internet. Part of their mission statement, part of their philanthropic aims. So connection is the key for all of us in working out how we manage healthcare in the next millennium. Ray Kurzweil uh, described something called singularity. This is the point that artificial intelligence overcomes human intelligence or human behavior how computers take over from what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Already, you've seen how they incorporate themselves into the world, how computers are taking over from what we do naturally. I use the, the term surgical singularity. What's the surgical singularity? Well, actually, if you think about it, at some point, is it possible, is it possible that a surgeon 
can be replaced by someone like a robot. We have clinical skills. We have history of examination, knowledge-based, and worth experience. And obviously, decision-making is quite difficult to learn in terms of computerization. However, how far are we away from our surgical singularity? He described singularity that would change in about 2030. That's 15 years from now. To some of you, that might seem only 15 years. But if you think about computers, where we've come from, if you look at Moore's law, with computers doubling their speed every 18 months, actually 15 years is probably an infinity amount. Things will change immeasurably in the next 15 years, and we have to embrace it. We have no choice, uh, because we can control the way it's governed, and we control the way technology will transform all of our lives. One of the things that used to trouble me uh, for many years was about teaching and training. And I remember a story of a medical student uh, who then became a doctor, who came back to see me one day. He decided to have a career in uh, medicine rather than surgery. He said, quite simply, Mr. Ahmed, um, I was a bit disappointed with my surgical placement. It was solely because I was in the operating theatre, I was ignored by my team, I sat in the back for eight hours a day, never saw an operation, never managed to scrub up. So actually, that's not right. What are we doing? These students of ours and trainers are paying a lot of good money, doing a lot of hard work into being trained, and we need to inspire them a bit better. The operating theatre is a theatre, that's what it's called, a theatre of dreams, a theatre of aspiration, a theatre of realisation, a theatre perhaps of really moving on with a career. And that's really our aim, to make sure that we suitably inspire people. So I've spent a lot of my time thinking about how do I teach people in this operating theatre. Obviously, the most important part is to do the operation. The patient's there, and that's clearly the most important part for us. But of course, you can use that in different ways. You can teach in the operating theatre. This is the Royal London Hospital in 1920. And it's rather like the central line on a Monday morning. You cannot physically get anybody else or wedge them into that operating theatre, even if you tried. Is that good learning experience? I fear not. And if we don't think it's good teaching or training, how can we possibly offer that to our students who are very much inspired by us? There was a theory, of course, that just being in the operating theatre and being in the, sort of in the realms of the majesty of a surgeon would be enough to enhance you. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've never had that experience yet. I'm still waiting for the first student to be inspired in that way. So um, a lot of you have seen the work I did a year ago on the Google Glass, and it made international and national headlines. It thrust by itself and myself into limelight to a certain extent. I thought I'd share with you the, the whole story about the Google Glass, warts and all. Okay, many of you asked, and this is the first time I'm telling you the entire story, with all the problems that you posed. About a year, well, Google Glass came out three or four years ago uh, as a device, a, a ubiquitous device that could replace a smartphone, it could video record, take telephone calls, message, etc. And I'm a bit of a techie and a bit of a geek. Uh, I thought, I must have one. How do I get one? At the time, it was only open to North America with the Explorer program. You had to apply, give reasons, and I applied and got turned down flatly. Anyway, I wasn't too disappointed. I thought, how do I get this in the future? A few months later, I was actually appointing some SHOs and, uh, for the, our trust. And one of them was particularly bright, very tacky. I said, OK, listen, I really like you, and I'm happy to give you the job. There's only one condition. <laughs> you can see where this is going. I he said, what's the condition? I said, OK, when you work for me, obviously do your clinical work, see the patient, look after my patients. But every morning, phone Google. <laughs> and then email Google. And that's what he did. He said, is that it? I said, yes. He said, deal. Mr. Ahmed, delighted. I'll be working for you. About a month later, I said, how are you getting on? He said, well, I think they've blocked my email, blocked my phone call. <laughs> I, think, I think they've had enough of me. They know who I am. So I was rather unperturbed. I said, never mind. You did your best. No problems at all. You're not sacked. You can carry on because uh, you've got a six-month contract. <laughs> I, I, I then, of course, moved on. And I had a friend in Silicon Valley who brought a glass over for me as part of the programme. So I got it on a Saturday, I played around with it, this was really interesting, I wonder what it can do. It wasn't about having the device, it's how you can use these devices to really afford um, in terms of uh, what we do in healthcare and other such things. And so actually, um, uh, about a week later, I thought, okay, this is okay. I gave it to my two medical students. Now, we have the best medical students in the world, no question, they're really fantastic, really talented. And so I said to Ali, who not in the audience today, but I said to him, look, here's a glass. I want to do this project about streaming, etc., teaching people. What can you do with it? Can you take it away 
come back and give me a solution. This was on a Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock. So I assumed he'd be away for a few weeks thinking about these things. Monday morning, he phones me up to Mr. Ahmed, it's working. I said, really? He spent all weekend up every night working out how to use his machine. If only he spent the same time working on his studies, he might have done a lot better in finals. <laughs> nonetheless, nonetheless, I was pleased he'd chose me over finals, of course. So, nonetheless, so he um, came back on a Monday. We were that's, that's pretty good. Monday afternoon was great. I said, well, the next thing is, can you make it stream? Can you make it stream to the world? He said, well, let me have a think about it. Off he went for another 24 hours. He phoned me on Tuesday. He said, oh, I managed to speak to a software company. They released their version just for us early to practice with. Incredible. Big worldwide company saying, why not have a go at this? So by Tuesday afternoon, it was working perfectly well. Robust system, reliable, not breaking down. So I said, OK, well, that's good. Will it work in the hospital? OK, Wednesday morning. <laughs> and nothing better to do. Let's get the glass out, try the Wi-Fi, see if it all works. And it worked. It was robust. It was working. I was pleased the stream was great. Could we stream to 1,000 people? Maybe. Maybe more. Who knows? We weren't quite sure where we were going with this. And I said, OK, I need to find a patient. OK? We need to be innovative. We need to move this in quickly. It just so happened I was operating the day after, on Thursday, uh, on a cancer case. So I spoke to our medical director. I said, uh, Steve Ryan, of course. Steve, um, it's what I'm trying to do with this gadget. Um, what do you think? He said, well, thanks for giving me so much notice, number one. <laughs> It'd be kind of you. And we spoke at length about mitigating risk. Obviously, you know, these things are new. Innovation is difficult. We have to be sure as a trust that we get it right, that it's safe for our patients, that we're not pushing the boundaries too far. Joe was also included in that conversation, uh, who nearly had a heart attack, of course. But I'm pleased to say that she's still alive after that conversation I had with her back a year ago. They were very supportive, and this trust is very supportive of innovation. So I spoke to her, I said, fine, let's carry on. I spoke to the patient that afternoon, I said, Roy, and he doesn't mind me saying his name, because he's, a, he's world famous. When he went back home after the operation, he had the world's entire television crew waiting for him outside. So he's very pleased. So Roy said, uh, I said, well, this is what I'm trying to do. What do you think? You know, give me your honest evaluation. He said, Mr. Ahmed, I'd love to help you. Um, I'm really happy that we should do this for, for the world and try and move things on. I'm really happy. So I said, fine, if I'll go for support, and his consent was important. Uh, we thought, OK, we'll do that for you. Talking about patience and a sort of compassion, which is where I'm slightly came from this, our patients are great to us. They forgive us when things go wrong, and also we try to do our best for them when we can. For example, today, when we're doing the TED Talks, I spoke to one of our patients who developed bowel cancer five years ago difficult problem, he needed difficult operations, and more than one operation to, to sort him out. He's now five years down the line. He's cured, potentially, of his horrible cancer after treating, being treated with surgery and chemotherapy, etc. In fact, his team are magical memories, creating the videos for text, helping us put something back into the Bart's health to help us promote our TEDx. So thank you very much, um, Imran, for wherever you are. That's how Bart's Health works. It's a compassionate place, but it works both ways. Our patients like us I I as well. So then back to the discussion, of course, about the glass. So that afternoon, um, we said, to the, uh, said, let's phone up the uh, media team here at the hospital, see if they can get some interest from local newspapers. So they're fine, okay, well, I made a phone call. Within about an hour, we had ITV News at 10, BBC <laughs> News at 9, News at 10. We had uh, Sky, Al Jazeera, all vying to do this live transmission. We then, of course, uh, got the uh, students to send out Facebook entries to medical schools around the world and trainees to see whether we get some interest. It went really rapid, it was very fast. We didn't realize the power of the internet, the power of social media, and how they sort of uh, disseminate the information. And I had a lot of learning from those 24 hours. For 24 hours, we we're ready. The patients coming to table, all anesthetized, we have uh, the ITN News at 10 crew in my face. <laughs> Literally in my face, okay? Not even a few inches away. We had the entire, we had 14,000 people all on the internet waiting, chatting about this new thing we're going to do. And it's really interesting. So uh, medical director was obviously concerned about the outcome, and, and, and you know, rightly so. At that point in my life, okay, I'll tell you something, I felt very vulnerable. I felt very lonely, I felt very isolated, 
because suddenly you're pushing the boundary. You're not quite sure the outcome's going to be. Actually, and I'll tell you the real story, is that about 45 minutes before we're going live, I got blurred vision. I kid you not. I thought, what's going on? My eyes, I just, um, I've got good eyesight normally. I'm reasonably healthy. Suddenly blurred vision. I thought, this is not good. So I went to my office, sat down. I thought, OK, we, d we can just either cancel this if it doesn't work, and we'll arrange the patient's operation by somebody else. It was probably stress-related. You know, there's a big pressure on you, because this was it. This was make or break. If it goes wrong, everyone would just walk away, and you'd be sort of holding the can at the end, which often happens in medicine, unfortunately. Thankfully, after five or ten minutes, the eyesight came back. They were fine, okay, we'll carry on. We did the operation, it went well, and the rest is sort of history. If you look at what was the impact of that operation was, we did a live operation within about 18 hours of notice, and 14,000 people, trainees, students, and the public, all switched on. There was interactivity, of course. People could text me on the glass. I could talk to them. They were texting me messages, information, and questions. I could answer them in real time across 132 countries. Not only that, it was 1,100 cities. Now, I can't name more than about 50 cities, but 1,100 is certainly a huge number. It seemed the world was looking for something new. How do you make this globalization of health? How do you reduce the size of who we are? Interestingly, 5,000 Australians used to switch on every time I operated. 5,000. They felt isolated in the South Pacific. They were part of the rest of the world. And by simple connection, they were now part of that bigger world and the greater good. And that was quite interesting in terms of the outcome. Going forward, though, where else can we do? So if you think about where we are now in terms of streaming, live connectivity, and smart glasses and smart wearable technology, we're now entering the world, or the enigma, as I call it, of augmented and virtual reality. This is doing something completely different, adding different dimensions in front of you. Also, with immersive headsets, you can transport yourself to another part of the world very quickly. This is where life is going. Oculus Rift was bought out by Facebook for 2.1 billion US dollars. Not because of the device, it was the concept of how do we use immersion? How do we create this discipline to another world and being trained, for example? So our vision now, of course, is to create something called the virtual surgeon. So we could put our headset on to somebody in a remote, remote part of Africa or in South America, and then they could trans be transported straight next to me, operating and be taught about the same time by me or anybody else around the world. Suiang mentioned earlier about doing small things, making differences. That's true. People need to be aware, go out to countries and help them. Also, you can make big differences by just with di many people using these devices. Wouldn't it be great, for example, if we put a device on, put a glove on, feel, touch a human body that's not in front of you? Wouldn't it be great if you could pick up a scalpel, make a cut, feel the cut, see the bleeding, stop the bleeding? Would it be great if someone from another part of the world could do that with you together? That surely is the perfect simulation. Before patients are operated on by anybody in the world, you could actually simulate the operation wherever you are. That's not really that far away. That's what I'm calling surgical singularity. Going back, now this is an interesting conversation, of course, we're having. See, I was sort of born in a very small village in Bangladesh. It's a village that was quite rural with no electricity, or very little electricity, that was intermittent, and a few hours a day. There was no radio, and no, certainly no television. There was no running water in those days. One thing is about human beings and inspiration and aspiration is that about 46 years after this, well, 40 years after this, I'm the person on the left, by the way, of that picture. I'm here now talking to you about technology transforming the world, how technology can inspire all of us going forward. That's the power of Bart's help. He inspires people here to do wonders and to move things on and to help with innovation. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I've had my 15 minutes.